Here we go. All right, so welcome back. <laughs> so hello, scientists of all ages. And I'm going to say it in Spanish as well, which is my native language. Hola, científicos de todas las edades. Please do study mathematics in, in both languages, especially in Texas. I'm delighted to talk about my favorite topic, robotics, which happens to be also my main activity most of my days. How wonderful. And I'm hoping to motivate people here of all ages to explore this vast field of science and engineering. Welcome to my talk on humanoid of the future. As a kid, I read a lot of manga comics and Isaac Asimov books. I also got my first PC, like many of you, when I was in middle school, even in those times. I started loving both computation and the physical science, sciences, which are chiefly combined in humanoid robotic systems. At that time, robotics sounded like an unconventional technology that combined a couple of really cool things. In one hand, artificial intelligence. On the other, physical mobility, which hopefully could help us in our daily lives. I was absolutely certain that sooner or later, human-centered robotics would be a, a, a game-changing technology. And here in this image, we see that 15 years later, Dreamer, our robot, which many of you saw outside, meets UT Austin's president, Greg Fembus. How game-changing this is as an ambassador of innovation and robotic technologies at the University of Texas at Austin. I went on for a PhD in Stanford uh, University in robotics, and I got very excited by a 2008 uh, report by the National Intelligence Council, which actually attempts to predict uh, the future, in particular disruptive technologies by the year 2025, so 17 years later. So really is trying to anticipate what's going to go on. And these are a list of the technologies that were predicted at that time. The first one is biogerontotechnology, which is the extension of human life, how important that is. Then energy storage, biofuels, clean coal technologies. If you're in those fields, now we hear about them all the time. But at those times, it was still fairly new to talk about them. But the fifth technology is service robotics. And I was very happy to see it considered as a game-changing technology. And in particular, the report stated that the development and implementation of robots for elder care applications and the development of human augmentation technologies mean that robots could be working alongside humans in looking after and rehabilitating people. But also warned that the change in employment could adversely affect lower income workers. So we have to be very careful with these technologies, not only robotics, but computation, mechanization, transportation, and so on and so forth, that they do change radically the way we do things. So please be sensitive about those things. Embrace them, but with care. I also got motivated by another report from the European company Fatronic, which showed that by age 70, 20% of the population suffers from mobility and manipulation problems. And this number, unfortunately, increases to 42% by age 80. Do we have to get sad? No, we don't. We need to think about life, what we call life after mobility, after we don't move the same way that we move today. And robotics can help out in several ways in providing, first of all, wearable devices, things that we can put in our bodies that will make us walk uh, again and cook our meals perhaps on our own. And second, elder care robots at home, Pe robots that will take care of our loved ones when unfortunately we cannot be there. And that's another compelling reason to pursue uh, research and, and, uh, and ventures in human-centered robotics. With all these facts, I became interested in the emerging field of human-centered robotics, which I define formally as a study of machines and robotic systems with high mobility to assist, augment, or represent humans in any way that will increase social comfort, productivity, security, and health. So the human is always at the center. We should not fear the robot. I guess that many of you do, but we should embrace it and, and have, have her, him help us. Um, and because robotics are not really limited by the, the same energetics than humans, we can create systems with incredible capabilities, like this robot from the movie Robots a few years ago. It has arms, it has this anthropomorphic look and feel, it has legs, also it can move, but suddenly it can use its energy to do 
wonderful things like process uh, things at home, for instance, uh, or conduct chemical analysis, or go outside and do m many complicated things. And this is precisely what we attempt to do with human-centered robotics. And this leads to the question of what can human-centered robots do, and how are they going to cooperate with humans? While I was doing my research as a student, I worked with the Honda Motor Corporation for many years. And this is the vision that we share together, that of supporting humans in our daily chores to make us more productive and take, taken care of. Another area of human-centered robotics has to do with operating robots remotely, for instance, using our cell phones. The idea is that many laboratories like mine we produce these systems that are very expensive. And you saw one here outside. It's actually a half a million dollars. But we don't want to be the only ones using them. We want schools like yours to use them. So we created a program com called the Cloud-Based Advanced Robotics Laboratory in which we connect students on the left here, teachers in this campus across the world to these devices. They can turn them on. They can teleoperate them. They can gather data. They can use them for their reports or for their high-end research. How wonderful it would be that these sort of programs, they happen for every single piece of machinery that is complicated and expensive in any university. It would be an incredible uh, um, uh, uh, gift for, uh, for, uh, for everybody interested on, on those technologies. Fortunately, this project was funded by the Longhorn Innovation Park for Technology of the Cochrane School of Engineering here on campus. And it led to uh, this video fulfill, fulfilling our vision. Let me play it. OK, it doesn't have volume, actually. But undergrad student of UT Austin, Bridget Owens, can control the robot with her cell phone. For this, we developed what is called a web framework, which many of you will end up working with this type of technologies. It contains a web server, a dynamic website onto which you display button simulations, uh, web, webcams, uh, all sorts of control processes, um, and a communication interface to actually control the machine. This technology allows us to ultimately teleoperate from home dreamer to clean up a table, for instance. You can see very clearly how this is going to be useful. It also allows us to take data and kind of analyze the impact of these uh, movements that we are analyzing or we are producing. And this can be beneficial, for instance, in the classroom for teaching geometry, and physics, and control systems, and programming, and so on and so forth. It's really a very comprehensive type of system. Another area where humanoid robots will soon be used involves cooperating with humans in harsh environments. Here we have two amazing agencies on the left and on the right championing these efforts, really, is happening. On the left, we have the Office of Naval Research, which has this vision of firefighting, because it's very important for their core missions. And they do it but with casualties. Normally, typically, when there is a firefighting situation, there is, there is two a pair of uh, firefighters working together. They want to substitute the person on the front that takes all of the, de all of the danger, all the damage, but at the same time cooperates with the person on the back guiding the fire. There has to be a cooperation between a machine and a human. The machine needs to understand what the human wants, where it wants to go, and the human wants to anticipate what the robot is going to do only by this kind of cognitive abilities or these cooperative abilities, these systems can, can come forward and be useful. On the right side, we have NASA. NASA has, here in Texas, in Houston, in Johnson Space Center, very comprehensive program on going to Mars, exploring it with human mission. And for that, robots have to go first. And they have to build outposts and habitats and instrumentation. And ultimately, they have to fit in the same spaces than humans. So we cannot really sign up a large card-like robot because it's not going to go inside the same spaces. So humanoids are being considered, being considered very seriously by these agencies. A final goal of human-centered robotics is to figure out how robots can safely share our everyday spaces. And this is the vision that um, I produce and, and other people share, obviously, uh, around. We want robots to transport things around. We, we, have, we have seen uh, Amazon.com trying to use uh, UAVs. And, uh, and man ground vehicles might become also very important. But what happens when they appear in this kind of a scene where there are kids over here? Do we have to perpetually try to avoid humans? Or do we have to do what we call biomimetic behaviors in which we actually copy what humans do? We are very comfortable engaging in contact. 
We can sense it, respond quickly, uh, move together with a human. We investigate how robots can do these capabilities. Just wonderful. We don't want to avoid being secluded from humans. We want to we share the same spaces or investigate those capabilities. Now that we've learned something about humanoids and human-centered robotic, let's talk about how can we make them move like humans. The picture on the left shows control points on the robot's body, such as the center of mass, which allows you to balance. When you move the center of mass, it has to be between your feet without falling. Control points include the legs for locomotion and the hands for manipulation. These are the very same points we use for controls. We use something called Cartesian frames. You are in high school, probably you have learned these things. X, Y, Z coordinates. We literally control those coordinates with control systems. We control them using a branch of mathematics called optimal control. Now, none of you in high school or middle school probably is doing optimal control, but you're gonna face those things where you go into mathematical programs, into aerospace engineering, into mechanical engineering, into computer science, and so on for, for, so forth. This is fascinating. And here, I'm not gonna go into details of the mathematics, but mathematics are so important um, for, if, especially if you are into describing movement uh, controlling movement, uh, analyzing what's go going on with, uh, with the human motion, making biomimetic behaviors. Mathematics is the main communication language of us on that front. And this brings us to the next topic, which concerns the field of legged locomotion, walking robots. It's amazing. The Navy has actually a program focusing on cognitive robotics and human robot interaction, and they're putting quite a bit of, mon of money. It's about $30 million uh, worth uh, yearly they funded our laboratory a few years ago to explore locomotion of humanoid robots in a structured environment. So you can see here kind of this vision of entering this vessel that is on fire and going to these clutter spaces and doing in contact with humans. Uh, now, I also want to advertise the, the Navy and how wonderful it is to work for the Naval Research Laboratory up in Washington, D.C. They have an S&T program, it's just wonderful, and high school kids, uh, 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 college students, they're very integrated. So I, I, if you are into these things, I completely support and encourage you guys to reach out to these places. For this project with the Navy, our focus has been on having robots walking over rough terrains and doing so with agility. Agility, we define it as the ability to change direction and speed very quickly. But we lack a general understanding or a scientific understanding of agility. What are the equations of agility? Give me the equations, sometimes I say, and I'll give, you, I'll give you the behavior. We lack robots that actually move around like the American Ninja Warrior, um, or humans put them on and become uh, superheroes. We lack applications, apps, like the Google apps or iPhone apps, that you download onto a robot and right away, they endow these capabilities. A kid on, on, on the house next to you has developed an application, you download it, and it works right away. But we want these things to happen, and these are the kind of things that we scientifically investigate. To illustrate agility, let's take the American Ninja Warrior competition. They're wonderful if you are onto these things. How can we stand, understand what these athletes are doing? How can we make robots do the same thing? And these are the very fundamental questions that we want to understand. And hopefully also transfer these skills onto machines. Because if we really understand them, machines can do them. We can have then our man machines, or we can make machines for the human when later on, unfortunately, we cannot do these, these motions, but we want to gain them, regain them again. To explore these questions, we built, a few years ago, we built Hume, this robot picture on the left side. It's an educational bipedal robot. It simplifies the human body to just two legs with simple point feet, but this is enough to move quickly in rough terrains. Hume weights 15 kilograms. It's force control in the sense that you can touch it and it knows that you are there. It knows that you are touching it. This is wonderful technology. It moves at 15 radians per second. Now, if you are into degrees, radians is the international system equivalent of degrees, which is an orientation uh, metric. 15 radians per second is very fast speeds. Probably uh, uh, speed runners run at these speeds, like uh, um, um, uh, Olympic athletes. It is unsupported. It means that you let it go, and it has to balance on this tiny point feet, like jumping stills. It's a very hard task. And it contains an array of sensors. It has feet contact sensors, the same as your Lego machines, for instance, 
but it also has something to know where you are in the environment. How can you know where you are in the environment? Sensors? What sensors? For instance, yes, that, that's, you can have a Kinet sensor, right? You can have UAV, how UAVs know they are in, in, uh, in the space, how they know it. But in GPS, right? But they also use something called inertial measurement unit. Inertial measurement unit, semi satellites. These are uh, something called accelerometers uh, and also gyroscopes. Gives you velocity and acceleration readings. You integrate them and it has, if it has very uh, small uh, drift, you can actually estimate where you're going to be over time. So you need these kind of positioning systems to know what your pose is and where you are in a space. There's a lot of computation going on. There is um, Linux systems, for instance, national instruments, they develop their uh, control boards and inside some of them have real-time operating systems. Uh, we have also physics-based simulation that anticipate how the robot is going to move and this is part of the software infrastructure. So robotics becomes a hard problem in part and the kids here that work in robotics are really very courageous because you need to know all of these things. You need to know the mathematics, the, the hardware, the sensing, the operating systems, and so on and so forth. Career in robotics requires a little bit of patience, as many other careers. So how do we tell Hume how to walk? Well, here is a happy human walking in the same manner that we would like Hume to walk. How do we explain this behavior to the robot? Well, first let's use physics. What kind of simple physical object can represent humans walking? Let's suppose only one leg is in contact with the terrain. A leg is like, like a stick, right? And at the end of the stick, there is a large, or large bodies, which are similar to big balls. What model has a stick and a ball? Right? It's a pendulum, right? That's it. We use what we call the inverted, we reverted, right? The inverted pendulum model to represent a human model. And this has gone for ages, for 50 years, for rehabilitation, for robotics, we have used that simple model. Now, let's take away the human and consider the pendulum only. Well, pendulums are very well studied system in mathematics. Here or lower, I don't pretend to understand it, we show one of the standard equations of pendulums, which is called a differential equation. The double dots means acceleration. Accelerations are proportional to the distance between the center of mass and the position of the leg. This also means, if you integrate this equation, that walking implies that we're moving exponentially. We're accelerating exponentially. And this is why we fall so quickly. If we're walking and we have a stone on the ground, our acceleration is exponential. So we run around the room and fall on the floor. So these kind of equations allow us to understand these kind of movements, allow us to predict the trajectories of the robot accelerating and decelerating. And therefore, we can, with programs like MATLAB, we can simulate what an actual walking pattern is going to look. Now that we have the trajectories for a single step, how do we calculate multiple steps? So this is similar to a gymnast here on the right side, wanting to jump a vault starting at an initial pose and finishing at a final pose. She has to mentally calculate when to touch the vault in order to perform the maneuver. Similarly, our computers calculate when to change the feet so we can climb the step on the rough terrain based on the pendulum trajectories that we showed earlier. We call this process, process motion planning. So this is one of the dimensions. Motion planning is the process of figuring out what to do to walk or manipulate or do whatever is useful for these kind of machines. Now, we're done, right? Well, no, we're not. Can we take these trajectories and directly download them to the robot to walk? And the answer is an absolute no. Why is the reason? What is missing? Balancing, balancing, but what we saw earlier is a way to figure out when to balance, right? Because the robot is not a pendulum, actually. It's close to a pendulum, but it's going to go somewhere else. Our predictions are a little bit off, right? So instead, we need to have something called robust control systems or feedback control systems, which constantly recalculate all the trajectories given the current state of the robot. So the field of control systems, the same that when you go to space, you have a rocket, it's constantly measuring and changing the thrust. The same thing happens here. With its own actuators, it's constantly correcting, recalculating, repositioning the next foot until it gets it right. And the, the result of all of these, when you get it right, all of these technologies, is that the robot can actually walk and support it. So let's see that. This is what can happen. We can now let this very delicate machine 
and it figures out how to work on its own for a while, for a while. And we do what I call here experimentation, 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 right? So a lot of hours in the laboratory, that's what we do. There's only three roads in the world that can do this with point feet. And, and ours is the one that has the smallest point feet, right? So we always have in this thing that my robot is bigger than yours, right? It's, it's kind of competition, right? All right. So now that we have understood locomotion using simple contact models, can we study locomotion use using our entire bodies, your hands and legs? The problem is that the previous pendulum model was too simple. A few years ago, we developed what we call multi-contact mo models, which consist of a bunch of sticks connected to a big ball. We use them to represent whole body locomotion, similarly to tensegrity models, robots that we see here uh, on the right side. And the nice thing about tensegrity models, uh, these are technologies also developed by NASA, is that the equations of motion of these models are also well understood. So we can do the same process that we did with the pendulum model. We can now produce these very sophisticated locomotion behaviors. Why? Well, because sometimes we use our entire bodies. If we're gonna go to the mountains, and we're having a, have a device with us that actually allows us to go when we're old, it has to use hands and feet the same as children do it today. But we can also use it for scientific questions. We can use these new models to study, uh, for instance, the movements of our primate ancestors. This is Lucy, a female hominid discovered in Ethiopia in 1974 and which lived about three million years old. And the question is, is she walk using her legs or only, only or using hands and legs? Well, I don't really know. But uh, we can analyze her motion using our tensegrity models. What's the simulation we have performed? I don't have sound. Is that correct? Is sound okay? Okay. So, uh, my apologies. So here we simulate her movement in an environment with multiple tree-like branches. The simulation, which is MATLAB, by the way, uh, performs the motions automatically. So we're not motion capturing or uh, figuring out some hand. It is automatically autonomously produced and we can use the resulting data to prove scientific hypotheses about Lucy. And this is how scientific discovery can be done. We're connecting robotics to anthropology. Perhaps we can figure out where these ancient humans came from by analyzing those patterns. Did they walk, did they live in the trees or not? Did they live in Ethiopia or live farther away? So it's just wonderful, all the dimensions of robotics. One of our dreams would be in the end, to help the elderly and the impaired to regain their movement by developing wearable technologies we call exoskeletons. They can take them outside or even help them to play again with their grandchildren. Wouldn't that be a wonderful technology that we could accomplish with robotics? Absolutely, right? And there are already some commercial devices out there that are starting to accomplish these capabilities. These ones are from Honda Motor Corporation. It is expected that there will be a big market, so we're going to make money, right, on exoskeletons in the near future. So get ready to work on these industries when you are older, okay? When you get out of your school, you might end up developing these devices. Is there a question over there? You have a question? Yes? Well, that's a good question. So um, he's asking if uh, these devices need to be bipedal. There is, this is the field of what we call orthotic devices. And uh, there's certainly a lot of possible combinations. Uh, and one of them is to have it for a particular part, part of your body. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that answer your question? Okay. Okay, so we have so far explored what can humanoid robots do and how they move like humans? Let's now explore how will humanoid robots in the future be like. And here are a couple of pictures of Robonaut, a robot by NASA in Arizona, which they use for exploring building nothing else than outposts in Mars. It's just a crazy idea. When I started working with NASA, I was like, they are nuts, right? I'm never going to really internalize these, these, these ideas. But fortunately, I spent a year and a half 
in Houston working with them and I was completely brainwashed. <laughs> so now I do believe it and I, I pass this information to my students. I tell them, look, you're not doing a project for NASA. You're believing that we're building outposts in Mars. And this is a Texas technology. This is not like some crazy, what, <laughs> country, right? This is Texas, right? <laughs> <laughs> and this points to the future of robotics. To advance these kind of capabilities, thankfully, Obama announced the National Robotics Initiative a few years ago. It's a, 30 million, it's a $34 million program yearly to accelerate the development and use of robots in the United States that work beside or cooperate with people. And that was done very timely because now we're competing and kicking something in the rear with the Koreans and the Chinese and everybody else. We are all friends, but we want the United States to do great on those areas. The first year the program was created, my laboratory proposed to the National Science Foundation a project in which robots would perform assembly tasks, building things precisely in rough terrains, not in the factory floor where everything is precise, but now going to the mountains, going to the uh, uh, unstructured factories uh, in your homes and so on with the same level of accuracy. Some of the key questions were, how to balance these robots when they, there's an object on the floor, how they're going to recover balance? How precisely they're going to do these manipulations given they're not bolted to the ground and everything is not deterministic? How to manipulate the environment with the help of humans? How to learn with the hum from the humans? How to combine and share the controls with the humans? We were delighted when we heard that our project was actually generously funded, but we were surprised at the same time when we heard that not NSF, but NASA was the funding agency. And the reason was because building outposts in Mars, this incredible idea by, um, by NASA, required the same skills, moving in rough terrains, manipulating the structured environments, communicating with the human, receiving commands, learning from the human. So we entered this project uh, at full speed. To pursue this research in an educational environment like ours, we started building uh, a dreamer with a company called Meka, which now belongs to Google. A lot of these companies, by the way, they're now being uh, purchased by, by big corporations. And we call it uh, Dreamer, as I said, right? And here is the picture. In cartoon animation, there is a well-known concept. If you like cartoons, many of you kids, I'm sure you draw cartoons, right? And you have to make them, well, sometimes not, but sometimes you want to make them cute. So there is the science of cuteness of cartoons, right? Or the science of not cuteness, if you go to the other side. And this is called the Uncanny Valley, which states that if you try to copy a human too closely, you know, eyes, and you, you, when you draw a friend of yours, right? Normally, if you're not an expert, it ends up being pretty creepy, right? <laughs> but if you simplify and exaggerate, exaggerate the traits of the face, it might actually look cute. We therefore look into one of my favorite cartoons, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, to motivate the design of Dreamer's head. And I believe that it was a success. And of course, we use the University of Texas colors for the hair of Dreamer as a recognition for the incredible support of this university to these kind of programs. Now I'm gonna embarrass my wife who's sitting here. Secretly, however, I had designed a head that looked a little bit like my wife. <laughs> and I wonder how many people in the world do get this awesome opportunity to design a human or robot that looks like a relative or like your wife, right? So please do try it, <laughs> just wonderful. Building a humanoid head was a key decision. It attracted so much attention and believe me, the robot didn't have a head for a year and nobody stopped in my laboratory. We put a head on and Michael Bay, the director of Transformers 4 was calling my laboratory for having Dreamer in the movie Transformers 4. She appeared during 30 seconds alongside actors Mark Wahlberg and Nicola Peltz. What a delight to participate in the motion picture industry and entertainment, obviously, is another of the dimension of robotics, whether it is for special effects, now we're gonna see a lot of Star Wars, we have here R2D2 somewhere here, right? Or uh, whether you actually make machines for this industry. Something to consider, animatronics. Disney has an entire program in robotics. You can work with robotics, build robotic systems, and work for Disney, how a wonderful feel. Another thing that you might consider when you finish your, um, your studies. But more importantly, Dreamer has become a symbol of innovation at the University of Texas at Austin. 
And the reason is because it combines many of the cutting edge technologies that this university excels and which, and which includes areas like machine design, many of you will like, electronic systems, building these complicated embedded systems, artificial intelligence, which I think that even high schools soon will start to adopt these kind of programs, and cloud-based computing. There's going to be so many jobs in cloud-based computing, among many others. As students, I do encourage you to come to this university, to become students, to become graduate or undergraduate students, to push our innovation much farther than we're doing here currently. So while working on Dreamer, a terrible tsunami, a big, big wave after an earthquake, took place in Japan. I believe it was in 2011. The waves didn't destroy, actually, the nearby nuclear power plant. They just went over the 60-foot contention wall. But they cut off the power, and after several days and attended, the, the, the reactors blew up, causing $100 billion in damage. The U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, also called DARPA, thought that this could happen in our country too, and decided to create a challenge. Anybody? The DARPA Robotics Challenge, to see if human robots could repair nuclear plants, nuclear power plants. Now, this is crazy. When they throw that, I was nuts, this guy, right? It consisted of eight challenges, right, in, in 2011, 2012, which included robots driving cars, just driving our everyday cars, right, autonomously, walking on rough terrains, just in any terrain that we normally go, removing debris from the ground, clearing areas, opening heavy doors, not just a door that you, you just move, but coordinating the forces, and, you know, it's complicated for us to move through a door, the same thing, climbing industrial ladders, breaking walls with tools, that was one of the craziest ideas, closing valves and assembling industrial parts. We thought they were truly nuts and we'll never accomplish that. But sure enough, we still went on and we teamed up with NASA Johnson Space Center to build the Valkyrie Humanoid Robot, a Texas, Texas production, which NASA anticipated uh, to look like this fancy and slick machine. That was before it was fabricated, okay? In paper, you know, you design your fantasy, we're all kind of laughing a little bit. <laughs> Is this going to happen or not, right? So this picture shows actually the end result once we built it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it looks like it gained a little bit of weight <laughs> during the design process. But we kept its human-like good looks, OK? To make this happen, four people in my laboratory, including myself, moved down to Houston, Johnson Spain Center, in, around Galveston for 15 months and work alongside a large and very talented NASA team. Unbelievable what kind of personnel we have there. We're literally locked in the room where the Apollo lander spacecraft was built in 1968 to go to the moon. And that's so inspirational. You know, these walls were hosting those devices. It was super stressful, honestly. <laughs> but what a great experience. So I do encourage you to sign up for these programs. And NASA actually liked very young researchers, some of them as early as high school. Maybe not for the full-fledged program, but for part of it. Our students at the University of Texas designed a unique actuator, the device that, that pushes this robot to be incredibly fast and high, these high, high payloads, uh, and, uh, which was able to generate uh, a huge amount of force, but in a very small package, and that's a trick. You have a very small thing that can lift a bear, <laughs> as my student says. And at the same time, sense the forces of the human. So it has to be very delicate. You have to be able to touch the robot with a minimal amount of force and, and have the robot uh, know about that. To our delight, it was immediately adopted by NASA for their rehabilitation program first. They have a rehabilitation program as well. Here we see these compact devices here uh, built at, at UT Austin used for rehabilitation, lower limb rehabilitation. People they have to exercise with a machine, which is also a huge market, by the way. Then it went on to be tested in the X2 MENA exoskeleton, which is a device that originally was designed for astronauts to do exercise in space. It forces them to move. But ultimately, it became a, 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 a nerve uh, device, which allow impaired individuals to regain movement. 
And you can see it here on the lower part because it's very compact and very power dense. And it turns out that our ankles, muscles, they produce the biggest forces for locomotion. It was a perfect application. We were delighted of seeing all these things happen. And it became, eventually, it became the new actuator technology for various parts of the Valkyrie humanoid robot. In this movie, we show the process of construction of Valkyrie with a great participation by our lab. We're delighted to see many of our ideas taking place in this amazing humanoid robot. Our students went on and designed actuators, control systems, testing, software, um, interfaces of all sorts. Human-robot interaction, you can see these actuators can sense the forces and respond to them and go on through an entire process of building a wonder, wonderful machine with very talented team at, uh, at NASA. Let me just wait for a second here. You're going to see our actuator in a second. Over here. This is technology developed here at UT Austin. And NASA adopted it as one of the key technologies for Valkyrie for walking. So don't be discouraged. Push your technologies forward. And maybe we will go to really amazing places. Ultimately, we're able to develop not only the upper body and the lower body, I put it together and compete in the DARPA robotics competition, demonstrating Valkyrie's ability to remotely operate in a nuclear power plant setup. Another wonderful uh, event for us. Don't get discouraged, you can accomplish these things as well. NASA also look at our uh, what we call whole body control software, large software architecture we develop. Here we show the infrastructure we build to control robots remotely, which includes a visualization tool. You see here this visualization on the left screen. It's called Arvis. It's actually what we call an open source visualization. A lot of this advanced software can now be downloaded and used by anyone. It displays the current state of the robot. Then using the head, the head has actually eyes. It's not for, for beauty. It has actually uh, lasers that allow you to reconstruct the environment with something we call a 3D point cloud. And this is transmitted over a low bandwidth communication channel and then superimposed with this simulation of Valkyrie. Kim, the operator, then single-handedly constructs behaviors using a software program that is actually similar to Scratch. Some of the programs perhaps you use. It's a visual program that constructs uh, 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 we'll call actions and motion planners. And you put them together, control sequences, and you construct a, a complete behavior. You simulate it, and one, once it works, you upload it to the robot, and the robot is going to perform it in the same way that we do it with robots in Mars. We simulate, upload, and then perform the behavior. So with a single hand, she's able to actually do this incredibly complicated behavior. This is how we control humanoid robots today. NASA really liked our work and awarded us the Elite Team Award for the design of Valkyrie. What a great honor from, from, from NASA. So again. Ask for prices, by the way, when you go to places. Hey, I did that. <laughs> Give me an award. Don't be shy about it. Today, not without lots of effort and pain, I would say also, Valkyrie is a successful program where four full human robots have been built and given to various universities around the world. This picture is just a couple of months old. This robot is actually for sale, and people are buying it. The Department of Energy. Universities in UK, uh, it's just amazing that we were able to be involved in this project. This is a promotional movie of Valkyrie made by NASA last summer after they completed the whole, putting together the whole program and really showcasing how awesome is American technology. You can see now all these actuators becoming alive and giving these kind of biomimetic behaviors. NASA has a lot of expertise in building hands. They look like, just like humans and they also do you know, hook and horns, right? And the robots, the legs that we, we, we develop with them, we can make them do these incredible things. Really strong. By the way, it's a female robot, if, you, if you're wondering, right? So you can, 
It's a bodybuilding athlete, right? He's in Houston, actually. Based on Valkyrie, NASA has created a new challenge competition called the Space Robotics Challenge, in which teams with Valkyries will solve problems found in space, such as building instrumentation and houses in Mars for human exploration. And US is going to become leader on these fields because of this program. What an incredible event. And as I said, NASA likes to enroll students at young ages. So do visit NASA, do apply for jobs. They have uh, programs for high schoolers. They have programs especially for uh, undergrad students. It is good to start early with NASA. They don't like people my age anymore. <laughs> I'm too old, right? They like, they like to get, you know, 19 years old, 20 years old. This is the age you have to go to NASA if you want to do a career. Just a wonderful place. There are many humanoid robots developed today, all of them for research purposes. Some of them belong to companies such as Google or Honda Motor Corporation. Will this type of robots become practical for commercial purposes? And in fact, the shape and form of a robot is not what is important. What is important is to provide new capabilities to solve real world important problems. And if a human-like form factor is needed, then humanoids can be a solution. In that context, some of the areas in demand for human-centered robotics include exoskeletons for assistance and special operations. We have the Chancellor McRaven of this university who was the head of US SOCOM, which is a special operations unit, and they develop things for keeping this country safe and, and for peacekeeping. We want to support these operations. Urban ground reconnaissance and first responders. Nuclear material handling. The Department of Energy is trying to purchase a Valkyrie to go inside the facilities and do the same things that humans do, but in a safe manner. Firefighting for the Navy, search and rescue. The Austin Police Department actually is interested on those technologies as well. Infrastructure maintenance, assisted living, orthot orthosis, orth orthotics, like this gentleman asked over there. These are the dimensions of human-centered robot robotics. Not all of them will look exactly like these humanoids, but an understanding of the very basic movements of humans will allow us to develop very effective devices. So as a conclusion, in the future, not too far from now, robotic technologies or robotic setups will look like this. Ready? There will be many more female researchers and students participating and leading great robotic projects. So please go ahead and sign up for robotics today. <laughs> Happy holidays in advance. I'm sure Dr. Santis would be happy to answer some questions from the audience. So please, we'll put the microphone right on this aisle over here. Please line up. But before we do, we have a uh, person who won the Ozobot competition. Is uh, Sumaya Sati? Is she here? Sumaya, are you here? Sumaya. Okay. Well, maybe she'll come later. So, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Senti, please line up at the microphone over here. So I was wondering um, how big of a problem is powering the robots? How big is the problem? Oh, sorry? How big is the problem of actually like, giving power to the robot and letting it operate? Well, it's a, it's a huge problem, um, especially these autonomous systems. They do uh, have a tremendous limitation on, uh, on autonomy. Uh, this has to be explored at several levels. Actuators, they're very inefficient uh, transducers. So we lose a lot of power compared to humans. We study something called the cost of transport, which is how much energy it takes us to actually walk from point A to point B. It turns out that humans, 
we're very efficient because the way we use our limbs and our, uh, uh, our joints becomes very efficient, but also because human muscles are very efficient. We have to understand, in one hand, how artificial muscles work and can be more efficient. On the other hand, how can we produce movements that are the most efficient possible? And third, also, the way we carry energy, increasing the power density, the energy density. Can you please keep it down so we can hear the speaker answering the questions? Thank you. So um, Elon Musk is kind of famously apprehensive of artificial intelligence. I'm just wondering if you share that sentiment at all. Well, I, I have very mixed thoughts. And um, uh, it can go any, anywhere. A lot of um, AIs are now... Um, taking place in the, in the high-frequency uh, trading industry, in part because there is a lot of money. So we're seeing a lot of uh, kind of warfare of AIs taking place there. It's very kind of adversary-oriented. They are not cer certainly friendly. They're trying to kind of kill each other. So um, AIs uh, ultimately will have to be regulated by uh, people that are interested not in a particular uh, society or company, but they are interested in, in humanity as a whole. I think that governments are perfect places to regulate how AIs are going to look in the future, um, and uh, as well as organizations like the UN. All these things need to seriously consider. What is, what is the uh, desire of an AI to accomplish something, and how this is um, programmed, and who is the programmer of those things? If it's high speed trading industry is going to be basically terrible. So the answer to this is that they're going to be the forces of, of, um, of, of the good and the bad, right? There's going to be people trying to do really bad things and people do, trying to do very good things. And, and the AI is going to be a reflection of those things. So the same way that today we have armies or uh, guerrillas that are doing good or bad things. It's going to happen the same thing with AIs. Hi there. So um, I was actually wondering, since humans are so complicated, and um, since we're trying to replicate them with all these humanoids, is there a different approach to actually getting a human-like robot? Uh, well, it all depends what you define human-like. Yeah. Um, some people are interested only on, on a hand manipulation, for instance. Uh, if you are interested in copying, you can go to extremes. Actually, there is teams... These are simplified humanoid robots. They don't have nearly as many muscles or uh, movements joints as a robot, or as a human. There is teams, one of them is in Japan, in Tokyo, that they try to actually mimic every single articulation and every single muscle just for the sake of having a replica of a human. So you can go to that extreme. That would be very kind of biomimetic and would help us to understand how our, our um, skeletal, musculoskeletal system works. Others, they are only interested in the in the abstraction of the behavior. If you are only caring about manipulation, you don't need to have five fingers. You might have a gripper with two fingers, with two fingers. It can be a suction um, cup, right? It can be a combination between uh, articulated fingers and suction cups. So sometimes we do try to replicate a skill of the human, and we try to find things that are actually not biomimetic. OK, thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. In your presentation, you mentioned that the dream is to have these robots in the future to be cloud-based. Now, I was wondering if there's software that can prevent hackers from potentially changing your friendly robot into a killer robot. Right. <laughs> this is a, a super important question that we are all terrified about. And I think I show uh, an image here when I was showing the, the, the Carl computation platform. in which, uh, actually, there are the students here. There is the teachers and professors over here. There is the robots on the right side, but there is a supervisor. <laughs> so the supervisor, what he's doing is a, is a judge, is, is, is seeing, trying to predict what the human on the other side is trying to do. Because the, the humans on the other side might be adversaries, might be not cooperating humans, or might be sloppy humans that are going to break everything. So this is important to have a, a way to judge the behaviors. It's important to have a, encryption. We are actually working with a team at UT as well that does encryption, encryption uh, hardware in, in a way that cannot be, well, it's incredibly difficult to decrypt, right? So there is, increasingly you have to add that, not only at the software level, 
but computers can get into your system. And now we have to remember that the robot is not a single computer controlling everything. It's like a car. It has many microcontrollers, and each of them has smarts. So if somebody goes and taps into one particular microcontroller, it can gain control of the entire machine. So th those encryption facilities, cap capabilities, have to be implemented for every single part of the body, all the distributed system. That's what has this to happen. But there is no a killer answer to this. I mean, we're being hacked every single day. We'll have to address it in the best possible way. Thank you. So what do robots like this normally run on? What robots like this normally? What do robots like this normally run on? You mean the power? So there is two types of uh, power system that we use. One is uh, batteries, and normally you want to have very power dense batteries. This goes very well if you're using electrical motors. So actually, we show robotics. We didn't talk how actuators are made. Some of them are electrical motors, which is a concept that was invented about 120 years ago, which electromagnetically ma rotates. So it needs to just hook it up to a battery system, and then it runs. But many robots run with hydraulic systems in which we push a hydraulic liquid and then by pressure we actually create a movement. There you need a pump, a pump that produces pressure. And those normally run with uh, gasoline or uh, diesel engines. So you can have these kind of two systems. Gasoline engines seem, tends to be very uh, power dense. So a small amount of fuel can allow you to run for a long time. But hydraulic systems are very inefficient. They waste a lot of energy. So there is a discussion of whether robots in the future will be done with uh, hydraulic systems, uh, like your construction devices, or will be done with electric systems, which are more efficient but less power density. Hello. Oh, hello. Um, do you see any point in the near future when robots will be mass produced and sold commercially to like, um, like every? an average person, like anywhere in the near future, and if so, will, the, will there be any safety protocols? Will there the be any? Safety protocols for the said robots. Okay, so uh, the robots are uh, getting close to be being ma mass produced. Uh, there is a company called Abder Alderaman Robotics that sells something called the Now, the now Robot, and it has been sold by the thousands. Um, there is another company, uh, I forgot now the name, uh, in Japan also that has sold thousands of, of small, relatively mid-sized. Actually, in, in human robotics, we have different sizes. We have kid-sized human robots. Sorry, we have toy size, kid size, teen size, and adult size. Okay? So the mass markets, depending on where you go. Right now, there is a market to be made on this kind of uh, kid and, and teen size robotic systems, uh, mostly for uh, high school competitions, um, entertainment, perhaps. Um, uh, home robotics, um, and so on and so forth. If you go to the larger sizes, then you go into, into um, uh, companies that want to buy them. They want to buy them for perhaps rehabilitation, for gaining movement. These are wearable robotic systems. I think another area is defense systems, systems that can go, can prevent soldiers getting killed, um, make sure that everything is okay, right? Um, these are kind of where we see a little bit of mass production. It's a different kind of mass production than your cell phone. Not the same scale, different scale. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Santis. Uh, could you talk a little bit about why we strive so much to make humans so similar to the robots that we're creating in applications where we only really care about its ability, like in NASA or the Navy? Like why it has to walk like a human or act like a human? So that's a real question. Um, it doesn't have to, but I think we have something in our unconscious that when we see a machine that looks like us, mm -hmm. we change completely our behavior. Uh, we, I said earlier that Dreamer didn't have a head for a long time, and nobody was coming in the same way that we're coming afterwards. When we put a head, people were expecting phone in different ways. People were not, wanted to, to high-five with the robot. People wanted to have a conversation. You can imagine there is a, another side of this business which is uh, people are lonely and they want to have a conversation. It's not the same talking to a, a can of Coke than, than talking to a, an anthropomorphic head. Mm -hmm. uh, NASA likes a lot of humanoids. Actually, when we developed Valkyrie, we uh, 
discuss all possible, you know, kind of spider-like robots, and, and NASA specifically wanted humanoids because they believe that for their crew members being in Mars for a long period of time, it would just make them feel much better to be with something that looks like a human. So it's more of a social thing. Sorry? It's more of a social thing then? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a psychological thing. There's a, a huge psychological aspect of wood machines you would like to, uh, to interact with. If you're talking only about the energetics and the agility, then you don't need to have humanoids. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's more than that, yeah. How could you solve the problem of robots? I'm going to put it very simply, robots jumping, because you would, I'm trying, I don't know how I'm trying to word this, but you have the, you already have the hard leg mechanics of just walking. Now how about when a robot, like right here, has to go down a, go down a step, how could you get this sort of shock absorber in there? Okay. Something? So th that's also a very good question. So actuators, they are normally co uh, connected to something called gears. Sometimes we call them drive trains. And these things tend to be rigid. So when you fall on the ground, actually, there is a large impact. It's not like our muscles. We have tendons and muscles that are soft. Many robots are very rigid. So if they jump, they can break internally. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we created something called serious elastic actuators. These are mm -hmm. actuators that they contain elastic elements, just like tendons, and they take all of the shock absorption. So these technologies do exist today, and they belong to the area of machine design. So if you're interested in these questions, you can go um, start investigating them in middle school, just making it, uh, you know, you can send us an email, we'll send you a drawing or something, or you can come to our laboratory, we'll, we'll show you some of these devices. Thank That's you. what we're gearing to, towards. Thank you. Go ahead. Is it possible to be a robot apocalypse? <laughs> <laughs> Is it possible that there will be a robot apocalypse? That the robots, they get too smart, that sometimes they do um, something is wrong, and they build more droids and take over the world? <laughs> so, let me answer this with a question. So a robot ap apocalypse means that they would Kill all the humans? Like, not exactly kill, but take over the world. What would be take over the world? Huh? What would be take over the world for you? Because computers are everywhere already, right? They already took over the world, right? Yeah. So I think that this is a difficult question, right? I think that maybe a way to see it is that will, will humans lose power, okay? Yeah. And, and it might happen, right? Now, we'll lose freedom. Um, I don't think so. I think that robots are going to allow us to produce more of our basic needs, uh, our you know, housing and nutrition, and, and if the politics are done right, it's just a society with a lot of abundance. So um, ultimately it means that we can be more creative. We can spend more time being creative. We will depend on a lot of machines. There is no way now you can invest in the stock market without a machine. There's no way. So you lost, it's not that you lost the power is that if you want to have a power, you need a machine to gain that power, okay? So that's what we're going to see in robotics as well. Thanks. Okay, so the last, the last person in line there, you, you'll have the last question, all right? And uh, here's a question from the internet. Colleen has been watching, and she asked the following. If robots will replace human jobs, then how do we keep jobs for those humans? <laughs> All very good questions. Um, well, machines have replaced uh, jobs all, uh, you know, in, the, in, the, in many revolutions. The Industrial Revolution, uh, transportation, uh, the car revolution, and so on and so forth. And computer revolution as well. Even lawyers are losing jobs nowadays. We might lose jobs as professors, right? Um, I was talking about having Dreamer actually teaching my class. <laughs> that might not be a good idea, right? Um, so the idea is being sensitive, the, the, uh, uh, the goal is to be sensitive, not to do it as an instantaneous, so governments cannot allow to suddenly fire, you know, half of the, uh, of the manufacturing industry for replacing them with robots. It has to be done incrementally. There has to be re-education programs. It's not that this person knows his skill, loses the job, and then she, he will never be able to find a job. She will have to wait for her children to get a job. No, now we have to re-educate that person. So I think programs of re-education 
are going to help a lot. If you lose your job as a, as a mechanics, maybe you can become a cloud computing software engineer. And that's where we have to go. So um, the little guy kind of stole my question a little bit, so I'll rephrase it. Um, as, and I know this is probably a buzzword question you get a lot as a robotics engineer, but as someone who has more of an idea of the actual pacing of development of robots, do you believe that the singularity is anything we need to worry about like anytime remotely soon? Well, I think singularities are happening uh, uh, in, in different areas. Um, synthetic life was created two years ago by Craig Ventures. Um, a complete synthetic uh, uh, DNA, for instance. Uh, and, and that, I, I, I would fear more than <laughs> anything else, right? A synthetic cell has not been created yet, but people, like my wife over there, she's trying to a little bit pursue these areas, right? Um, uh, there has been, I think that another singularity has happened in the stock market. In, until 2008, there was uh, brokers that by hand they would do all the trading. There's no way a broker is going to do trading today. Computers are engaging into contracts, okay? Sometimes I like to think that a singularity is when AIs will be able to own, own things, stocks, assets, bank accounts. Okay, and that's another form of singularity. Um, uh, and and I, I think we're not too far from these things. So is, that, that's the answer of, of the singularity. Uh, now, if it's going to uh, make us irrelevant, I, I think it's the same question that for, your, uh, for, for the kid over there, right? Uh, I think that will augment our powers. It will not reduce our powers. Thank you. So... As robots sort of interact with humans more and more, I would assume that they would need to have a pretty good understanding of how humans work and how they operate in their environments. Uh, one, qu one problem that I could think of is how to either understand or connect with humans on an emotional level. Where are we in robotics as far as having uh, robots that can have a concept of empathy or even sympathy? Well, I, I think empathy is a very difficult concept. Um, Motivation, empathy. Um, I, I, I don't know where we are. There is a journal called um, Artificial Life where these things are investigated. And, and it's really a very serious scientific journal. Now, I think at the be beginning there was a lot of hype of doing a, a holistic sort of approach to artificial life, but later they became more of a, a particular piece of our lives that could be actually synthesized, right? For instance, you say empathy or something like this. And they create AIs that they have this particular and they can make hypotheses and answer them. Um, uh, uh, there is a lot of work in uh, cognitive architectures and a lot of good, actually some of them they are open source and they're used widely. Cities, cities for evaluating your energy expenditures some of them use cognitive architecture. They try to uh, have a, a mental model, a symbolic, what's called symbolic reasoning of what, what people are doing around and trying to take decisions. Um, uh, so that's going pretty far. Uh, a holistic, uh, artificial or synthetic AI is not something I see happening any soon, but I do encourage you to read about, in the synthetic side, about artificial life, and on the biology side, how to create um, uh, uh, artificial uh, neuron systems that ultimately might become your, your systems that ultimately have emotions. Uh, I think it's worth to look into, into both things. We're still pretty far in my opinion. Thank you. Hi, thank you for a wonderful lecture. Um, I had thank a you. question. Um, can robots evolve, like learn from its mistakes and evolve? Absolutely, absolutely. There is um, uh, evolutionary algorithms, that is what they do. There is another area of computer science that if you, you can start looking at it, it's called reinforcement learning. The idea that um, you, uh, you perform a task, you have a, a, you have a, a way to quantify how, how well you do it, and you have a way to actually make variations. And you study all the possible variations, you know, you, you do it a little to the right, to the left, you close, open, and ultimately you, you end up learning how, how to do it. And these are hugely successful fields nowadays. Machine learning, 
in robotics is it has an explosion of capabilities today. So I encourage you to look on, on these things. Thank you. Uh, uh, I was wondering, would there be a time it where it in which a robot would be able to have have a brain and be able to uh, connect with other people or think for itself and program other robots? Would there be a time that that would be possible? And can I have that R two D two? I'm not a decision maker. So you have to ask Jay, actually. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that uh, there is a lot of efforts on having uh, large efforts on uh, synthetic brains, with especially with cognitive architectures. Um, there's also efforts on simulating the real human brain. And one of them, actually in Europe, they are investing now a billion dollars to many, many universities to ev all the knowledge they, know they have, all the biological knowledge, all of the computational knowledge to put it together. It's a tremendously difficult uh, process. You probably will have to spend you know, trillions of dollars for this to happen. But given enough amount of effort, probably it's, it's possible to, bring, to build something that it has responsiveness, it has some mental models, um, it has a lot of information, it can learn, and it can adapt pretty quickly to many situations. From there to programming other robots, robots programming other robots that explore in the area of artificial life is very limited, the capabilities right now. There is systems that can produce all the systems, but nothing with large consequences at this moment. I'm hoping that with more investments, these things can happen in the future. Everything Thank is you. proportional to money. <laughs> but in this case, trillions of dollars. How do you, like, how do the robots have How does a robot have software if it doesn't have an app? <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> That's a new generation, right? So uh, robots have a computer inside. And the computer has something called an operating system. In the operating system, you create programs. The, have you used something called Scratch no. before? Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's the same as an app. That's, that's the answer. Before we call them programs, now they are called apps. So software is an app, or an app is software. It's made out of instructions that the machine can interpret and can show you images, move them around, communicate with other devices. That's an app, and, and, a, and a program, a software, is the same thing. Apps were created for cell phones, and that's the name that was catchy. I'm not sure you, <laughs> you buy you. this my, my answer. Thank you for your question. So since, it's, you. since what we'll do now is uh, Dr. Santis will be happy to continue to answer questions, but we're going to stop now to turn the lights on and thank him one more time for his excellent presentation. Okay, we'll continue to have questions. If you do need, need to leave, please, this would be a good time, and please be quiet as you